and action. All right, hey everyone, I'm Sam from Prismic, and uh, in this video today, um, I'm here with Delba from Vercel, and uh, we're gonna be talking about how to find your first job as a developer. Thanks uh, very much for joining me, Delba. Thank you. And uh, thanks for agreeing to talk about this subject. Um, and we're gonna actually start with an interesting angle. A lot of people wanna start by you know, tips for how to build your resume or whatever, mm -hmm. but we're actually gonna start by talking about how to choose a company, which is one of the most important steps that people often forget about. Yeah, yeah. So um, how would, uh, first of all, why is it important for a developer to be deliberate about choosing companies that they wanna work for? Yeah, so I think that uh, when you're a junior developer, you're just you know, starting your career. So it's very important to choose a company that will help you grow as a developer. Mm -hmm. And also to choose a manager that will enable you to grow. Um, Sorry, what does that mean, a company that mm -hmm. will help you grow? Like what would a company that doesn't help you grow yeah. look like? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of companies um, they might have different priorities. So they might mm. focus on, uh, you know, expanding their product, if, especially if they're a startup, they need to move fast. Um, so as a junior developer, if you find yourself in an environment that is focused a lot on, you know, the product itself or the business, you might find that you actually might fall behind if you don't have all the skills that are required to co to complete the job. So when I say a company that will help you grow or a manager that will help you grow, it's someone who's willing to invest the time to actually guide you and give you the tools and the skills that you need to perform your job. Um, and as a junior developer, um, one thing that I found as well when I was you know um, interviewing for companies is that a lot of them um, were not interested in like hiring me because they thought that I would need like a mentor or something like that. And that's not necessarily true. I think as a junior developer, what you need to uh, check for when you apply for a company is whether they have, you know, an onboarding process or whether the team that you're going into has a very strong feedback culture because you learn by building things with other people and seeing how they work. So you want to make sure that the company that you're going into, it's very transparent and has a, a team culture that will help you grow. You don't necessarily, I think, need a mentor when you start off a, at a company, but you know, having a team that is in a manager that is you know, willing to just, um, they understand that you're new and you, you need to do some catching up, that can go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're a junior developer, you want to optimize for growth. Um, and growth is related to your environment. So when you um, progress further into your career, you might want to optimize for impact because you want to see the result of your work. So, so when you're younger, you want to optimize for your personal growth. Uh -huh. And when you become more senior, it's worth looking for positions where you can uh, expect to create some sort of an, a broader impact. Yes, a broader okay. impact in the, on the company. And when I say impact, I don't mean necessarily just your individual impact as a developer, but the collective impact of the team that you work right. in. Right. Like you have direct influence over the culture of your team, uh, whether you're conscious about it or not. So you need to create an environment for yourself and also for junior developers um, that will increase the overall impact of your team, or, or as I like to say, your collective impact. So you're looking for a company where you can imagine um, it's obvious that they have structures in place for helping you learn, where you can see that you're likely to grow and that maybe someday mm -hmm. you will be empowered to make an impact. Yeah. And you mentioned looking not only for uh, a company where you see those traits, but also specifically looking for a manager. Mm -hmm. So how can you find a good manager? Yeah, so when you're starting off your career, and I think you could probably relate to this, it's it's tough to know what a good manager is, mm -hmm. like what traits they they possess that will make them a good manager. And you can get stuck if you if your manager isn't directly invested in helping you or giving you the tools to do your job well. 
You need a manager who wants to nurture and support you and help you grow. Exactly, right. exactly. And you may not always be in the position to choose your manager, but if you do find yourself you know, interviewing with someone who's potentially going to be your manager, you probably want to ask them questions about you know, their management, sorry, not their management style, their working style, their team, how people work together, and speak with people in the team as well. So just to give you an example, we have someone new in our team at Vercel. His name is Hassan. And um, when he was interviewing for Vercel, he actually reached out to me to ask me how it was like to work at Vercel. Wow. So that signaled to us that, you know, he was interested in the role, but it also helped him get a better idea of the working environment um, mm -hmm. because I was potentially a future teammate um, and I had more insight into, you know, what it was like to uh, work with our manager and work with our team. So you really can do that as a junior developer if you know, you know, who will potentially be in your team, mm -hmm. because it will give you a better sense of whether that's the environment that you want to work in. Mm -hmm. How can you prepare for an interview? Like, what kinds of questions can you ask mm -hmm. in an interview to get a sense for the company and the manager? Yeah. I think um, interviewing is kind of a art, and I don't think I've mm -hmm. nailed it yet. But what I would say is that interviews, they go both ways. Um, there used to be you know, a time in, in many other industries where interviews are one-sided. They ask you questions, you answer the questions. Whereas I think interviews should be more conversational. Uh, you're showing the company um, your skills and your kind of potential, especially if you're a junior, but you also want to learn more about the company that you're, you're a part of. And a good signal for me or a green flag of a good interview is when the person interviewing me is actually turning it into a conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, they're happy to answer any questions that I may have about, you know, the company itself. Uh, for example, when I was interviewing for Vassal, um, the, the interviews felt very much like conversations where they would, you know, share things about the company. Uh, and um, one thing that I noticed as well is that they always spoke very positively about the company when I asked. Like, I would ask about, you know, what the product engineers were working on and they would, you know... They're excited. They were very excited yeah. about their colleagues and what they were working on. So those are all good signals. Um, that's, a, that's a green flag. Yeah, that that's a green flag. The conversation, that the interview feels like a conversation that people feel excited about what they're talking about. Exactly, exactly. And also when people, um, they they talk positively about their work environment and their mm -hmm. colleagues, that's also another green flag that maybe this is a good environment to work in. What are other flags you can look for? Um, so I think there are green flags, but I would love to talk to you about red flags as well. Red flags, yes. Yes, because... Very important. You're very important, like you can't ignore them. So from my personal experience, uh, when I was interviewing with different companies, there were certain things that just didn't sit well. Like, for example, the interviewer was late or they uh, talked over me or they, you know, mm -hmm. didn't respect my time. And there was one particular interview I remember where the person was the COO of the company and he was talking badly about his staff and also customers. <laughs> so. As a junior developer, you may feel pressured to, you know, accept offers from these kind of like interviews or bad interviews, but you don't have to. And it's very important for you to be able to recognize those things and decide, okay, is this a signal that this is going to be a good environment to work in mm -hmm. or not? So I feel like um, when developers are presenting themselves to companies, there's actually more to consider than just the resume. As a developer, you're mm -hmm. often working on the web, so your entire web presence is important. Yeah. So how should you think about presenting yourself to companies as like an entire online presence? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's very important as a developer to make sure that you have a very good, consistent online presence. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is... 
it's kind of related to what we call a personal brand or a personal online brand. Um, I like to look at personal brands as an extension of who you are as a person, but a version of yourself online. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could be, you know, your social media profiles, your Twitter, um, wherever else, you know, you, you're present in like TikTok. <laughs> Some developers now use TikTok. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's also uh, the artifacts that you have online. So your portfolio, your GitHub, any other you know, uh, platforms that you find yourself in. Because as a developer, um, people can learn about you before they actually invite you for an interview. Mm-hmm. And just to give you a backstory, um, when I decided to join um, tech and to learn how to code, I had to work uh, a job that was unrelated to help pay the bills. So I worked for a recruitment company And I picked up a few things there about, you know, how recruiters approach people and how they make decisions between who they're going to, you know, Mm -hmm. reach out to for certain positions. And it was funny because the way that I got the job at this company was I I walked into the agency and I said, hey, I'm looking for a temporary job. Um, And they offered me a spot, you know, right there in the company, (laughs) right there and there. And after a few days when I kind of... Mastered the the um, the uh, confidence, I guess, to ask the manager why she hired me. She said it was because when I walked into the agency, I dressed and I also spoke like the person that she wanted to hire. Mm. Um, and she was like, "Oh, you were wearing, you know, this turtleneck and <laughs> these round glasses, and you just looked like the person that." I wanted to hire. So it's like even before your resume. Even before my right resume, there. exactly. And funnily enough, ever since then, whenever I'm in a situation where, you know, I'm interviewing somewhere or even, <laughs> you know, talking in front of a camera. On YouTube. I wear turtlenecks. It's kind of become, you know, the <laughs> thing that I <laughs> that I do. Um, and I haven't had to submit an application for jobs ever since. So after that, I, I worked as a marketing agency. I worked for Lambda School and now at Vercel. And for all those companies, I didn't submit an application. And I thought maybe it was like just a streak of luck. I was in the right place at the right time. And maybe it was my personal luck. I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. I hope people are hiring me because of other reasons. Um, But it taught me something about having a personal brand, especially a very consistent brand Mm -hmm. that helps you become more memorable to people. So when you think about your online brand, it's not just about, you know, your profile uh, picture, your Twitter image, whatever. It's also about the tone that you use. Mm -hmm. It's an extension of who you are online. So it's very important to think about how you want to contribute to the developer community online and how you want to relate to people online as well. And I think that me sharing my journey and sharing my portfolio on Twitter helped me a lot, both when it came to Lambda School, like applying for Lambda School, they they wanted to know that I was coding consistently and I was able to share my 100 days of code journey Mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter with them. And then with Vercel, um, like sharing my portfolio and uh, talking about how I built it and things like that, that was also very helpful. So mm-hmm. I think it's very important to be conscious that when you are sharing your journey and specifically when you want to get a job as a developer, to know that you um, you have influence over your brand, whether you consciously or <laughs> unconsciously think about it. I like you use the phrase coding community and I think uh-huh. we think of you know, I mean, we've all grown up with some form of social media at this yeah. point, and we generally think of it as like our personal space where you can kind of vomit onto the internet. Yeah. But when you become a developer, that digital space does become a community space. It becomes mm-hmm. a space where you're sharing things and collaborating. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And of course, you can, you know, uh, share whatever you like, but you also need to be conscious about other people and how you might be influencing that community. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to culture, we all influence the culture of the community. So it's very important, at least for me, to to, um, make sure that whatever I contribute to is, you know, something positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You mentioned that you haven't applied for a job in the last four positions that you've had, mm -hmm. um, which seems to contradict the conventional wisdom that uh, if you're applying for a job as a developer, you might want to apply for 10 jobs a week or 20 jobs a week yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. How effective do you think that style of job application is? Yeah. So I think that it's very um, hard to sit here and say you shouldn't apply for that many jobs um, because that's what some people have to do in order to break into the tech industry. And my approach has always been that if I'm going to have to apply for, you know, dozens of jobs or a certain number of jobs a week, and I'm not actually getting a um, response or it's not being effective, the, mm -hmm. the tactic that I'm using, then I need to stop and reassess what it is that I need to improve on. Um, and I think that the way that you improve is by first, if you can and if you're able to, um, asking for feedback from those companies after a rejection. Uh, because those companies, um, they will, well, not all of them, but some of them do take the time to tell you, you know, mm -hmm. um, you need to improve on this. Like, for example, um, when I was, uh, when I posted my portfolio online and said that I was looking for a job, uh, one of the companies that I interviewed with rejected me because I I had deleted all my GitHub repos from GitHub yeah. and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you kind of, developers yeah. are cringing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't do not do that. I wasn't proud of my code and I really didn't want recruiters to look at it. Mm -hmm. But um, it was one of those things where, you know, because I did that, I got a rejection because my GitHub looked, was, empty. looked empty. And your contribution yeah. graph was uh, my blank. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So there are, you know, certain things that you might do that you think it's a good idea at the time, but it it's not. So, so it, it's important to get feedback. It's important to get feedback and mm -hmm. to, um, if you can, uh, ask people around you as well in your mm -hmm. community. Yeah, whenever I have friends or colleagues who are doing professional, you know, like applications like that, mm -hmm. I always beg them. I'm like, please let me look over it for you because it, yeah. you never know what you're going to miss. You know, exactly. what might be that little thing that exactly. makes somebody. Exactly. And I think that... Um, like going back to what we were saying about, you know, applying for dozens of jobs. Um, I don't think anyone in the tech industry, unfortunately, like they have to do that, but any, like they should do that. I think mm -hmm. that if you're not seeing results, it's good to just stop and reflect, okay, what it is that I need to improve on? Is it yeah. my portfolio? Is it GitHub? Is it, you know, like maybe it's my voice on social media. Am I saying things that I shouldn't, you know, say or wouldn't get me hired? Yeah and just reassess and then change your strategy slightly to make sure that you know you're getting those those interviews and those results and even though most of us spend many hours working on it it's probably not the font you chose for your resume no <laughs> probably not uh and also the layout the layout it's yeah yeah <laughs> not going to be no it's not going to going to be the Thing like that if you have to choose it. between tweaking the layout again and proofreading uh -huh. it, probably yeah. choose proofreading it. <laughs> proofreading it or adding to your GitHub, making sure your code is out there. <laughs> um, what are, um, how can uh, new developers use networking as part of this process? Yeah. So with networking, um, again, I think we both went to boot camps and we probably mm -hmm. had to like meet a certain quota of people we reached out to. Um, the way that I see networking, um, especially when you're looking for a job, is I don't think, and again, this is a biased opinion, um, so take it with a pinch of salt, but uh, I don't think that you should network just because you want to get a job. I think that when that happens, it's very clear for people, like for people to see through that and to see that you actually have an interest in, you know, something else. And when I used to work for Lambda School, I used to get students telling me that networking felt very inauthentic and I, I think it, it does feel a bit inauthentic if you know the only thing that you want to do is, is get a job if you only want to get a job people can kind of see through that. yeah they can see through that so to me um, networking is much more about you know the community itself and connecting with people and following people who you admire who are working on something that you're interested in or who you think you can learn from. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you do that, um, and when you focus on growing your community uh, instead of just getting a job, I think that jobs tend to come much easier than then mm-hmm. because people can see that you're genuinely interested mm-hmm. in you know what what they're working on mm-hmm. um so just to g- give you an example uh, i would say that the way that um i was able to uh get an interview at Bercel was through my network mm-hmm. i had connected with the person that reached out to me from Bercel uh months before uh because i saw a post that they had on linkedin about management mm-hmm. and they were talking about how um, under the right managers, someone can grow. And I really liked their perspective on management. So you didn't connect with them because you wanted a job. You connected with them because you were interested in something that they were interested in. Exactly, exactly. I thought, wow, this person sounds like a like he's a really good manager. Like I want to learn from him. And I, and it was funny because I didn't really talk to him on LinkedIn. I, it was kind of like a this funny dance where I looked at his profile, he looked at mine, I looked at his, <laughs> you know, LinkedIn tells everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and that was kind of it. But then a few months later, when I posted my portfolio online, and I said that I was looking for a job, he looked at my portfolio, and he reached out. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's also, I think, important to make sure that you show your interest in certain things as well. Like, for example, when I created my portfolio, I put at the very bottom that I that it was built with TypeScript, Tailwind, and Next.js. And that was just to show recruiters that I was looking for a specific stack. Mm-hmm. Like, those were the tools that I was using. But little did I know that, you know, just adding that little line Next.js at the end of my portfolio would draw the attention from someone from Vercel. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's like just when it comes to networking, I, I think it's just... Make sure that you're genuine and connect with people who you identify with and who you think you you know you could learn from and people who could help you grow. Be genuine about your interests and yeah. follow your natural curiosity. Exactly. Exactly. Um, speaking of that, what do you think good companies are looking for in prospective junior employees? Yeah. So I think when it comes to uh, juniors, um, the main thing that they want to see is that you have potential. Um, and potential is one of the things that it's really hard to measure during a hiring process. Like when you when companies design their pipelines and you know what questions they want to ask candidates, et cetera, it's really hard to build that into, you know, the the hiring process. Like how do you measure potential? Mm-hmm. Um, so what I found, and again, this is from my personal experience, was that just showing a genuine interest in the company um, is really helpful. Like, for example, I posted my portfolio online when it was half finished, which, again, it's a risk. But <laughs> but it shows that, you know, things can happen even if you, you don't feel you're completely ready. Um, but anyways, um, when Vercel reached out, I... I really wanted to show them that I was interested in them because I, I generally, you know, was. I, I I admired myself for a very, very long time. So what I started to do was I started playing around with their website in, you know, on the dev tools and trying to figure out how they built certain components in their websites. Uh. So I then started recreating those components. Um, and... During the interview, uh, one of the people actually told me, like, the fact that you're actually doing this and you're trying to figure out how we built our website is a very good signal to me. Mm -hmm. So, again, showing a company that you have potential, you do that through your code and through your skills. But you also need to show them that, you know, you're interested in the company itself. I'm sorry, that was very long-winded. but (laughs) it's it's good. It, It sounds like it's not so much about demonstrating that you can write perfect code or that you can write really complex code, Mm -hmm. but showing that you can kind of like develop and that you will, that you'll keep, that you're willing to try. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think they do really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and this is the other thing, I guess, the downside of mass applying is that when you apply to lots of different companies, it's really hard for you to show each company that you're interested in them 
Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's the tactic that you're going for, uh, then it's fine. But if you have companies that you really want to work for, then really go the extra mile to show them that you're interested. Cool. cool. Well, thanks very much for all Thank this you. advice. So it's really exciting to hear um, your thoughts on this and I hope really helpful to anybody who's watching. Um, so in the next video, um, we're going to talk about what's new with Next.js. And Delba, you're going to tell us all about like the latest and exciting new features yep. um, and developments. So um, subscribe if you don't want to miss that.